Feeling a little confused by RetroArch configuration files? We'll help you power up your know-how. The key to using config files in RetroArch is to understand that they work in a hierarchy. RetroArch stores most of its settings in a global config file named RetroArch.cfg. This file is found in the root of your RetroArch install. Additional config files can be loaded based on these conditions. The core you're using, the directory you loaded your content or ROM from, and finally, based on the specific game you're playing. RetroArch loads these files in this order. So when we launch RetroArch, first the global config is loaded. When a game is launched, RetroArch checks for these additional configs, and if they exist, it goes up the hierarchy, overriding any settings specified in the previous files. Let me give you a simple demo of how this works. Here are the innards of the RetroArch global configuration file. It's in plain text, so as you scroll through it, some of the settings will begin to make sense. But for the purpose of this demo, we want to take note of two particular settings. The input overlay, which is null or unspecified, and the input overlay enable, which is set to false or off. Now with RetroArch open, I'll open the quick menu, go down to overlays, turn overlays on, and then I'll select this super sweet NES overlay. By the way, all the overlays used in this video are developed by user Orion's Angel and the shaders by Hyperspace Madness. Be sure to check out their awesome work. Links are below. By default, RetroArch will auto-save any changes made to the global configuration upon exit. There are some exceptions to this which we will address in just a bit. But we can now see the changes that we just made reflected in the global config file. Now here's where additional configuration files really come in handy. Because when I open this Sega game, the NES bezel is still in place. A Sega game on a Nintendo console might be commonplace now, but back in my day during the console wars, this would have been just plain wrong. I can go into the overlay settings and change to a Genesis overlay to make everything right in the world, but I don't want to have to change the overlay setting every time I load a game from a different console core. That's where the core config file comes in. To create one, I go into the quick menu, scroll down to overrides, and here we see the three types of config files we mentioned at the outset. Core, Content Directory, and Game. I've entered windowed mode here because I want you to see what happens behind the scenes when I create the core override file. All config files other than the global retroarch.cfg will be stored by default in this config folder which is found in the main RetroArch install directory. There are folders in here for each core you have installed and the override config files will be created in the folder that corresponds to the core currently in use. I'll go into the Genesis GX Plus folder and I'll explain this OPT file in just a bit so let's ignore it for now. However, when we select Save Core Overrides in RetroArch, watch what happens. It creates this core override.cfg file. When we compare this core config with the global configuration file, we see that the override only contains the two settings that were changed. The Genesis specific overlay I selected, and also this video full screen equals false because I created the override while in windowed mode. So with this override in place, every time I load a game with the Genesis Core, these two settings will take precedence over the same ones that are in the global config. The rest of the global config settings will remain the same. So in what scenario might we use a content directory override? Consider this. The Genesis GX Plus Core will emulate more than just the Genesis. It will also emulate the Master System, among others. So if I'm using the Genesis GX Plus Core for my Master System games, which I am, when I launch a Master System game, 
the core override I just created will use a Genesis overlay. And it will also open in window mode since that was what was specified in the core override. This is a pretty good reason to keep your ROMs organized into separate folders as I have here. Genesis for one, master system in another. This way I can set a master system overlay, which looks great. And now I will make a content directory override. Back in my config folder, we can see it created a config override for the master system directory. When we look at this new config file side by side with the others, we see that it captured my overlay setting change, but something is missing. I saved the override in full screen, but as you can see, it didn't capture that setting. And sure enough, when I load a Master System game, it loads the correct overlay, but still opens in windowed mode. This is a limitation of override files wherein sometimes they will not capture all of your desired settings. Don't ask me why this happens, but it is documented in the RetroArch user guide. The only real way to get around this limitation is just to work manually with the configuration files. In this instance, we can either delete the full screen setting from the core file so that both the core and content directory configs inherit the setting from the global config, or we can copy the full screen setting from the core file to the content directory file and give it a value of true for full screen on. Don't forget to save the file when you're done editing. Either way, we can see now that our Master System game launches in full screen. Lastly, let's take a look at a game override config file. I'm going to load a game specific overlay, but before I save the override, I also want to set the audio to mute. I used to play this game as a kid with the volume all the way down in my MC Hammer cassette at 11. Can't touch this. Now I'll go back into the overrides setting in the quick menu and I will select save game override. Going back to our config folder, as we would expect, we see that there's now a game specific override in the folder. So looking at the contents of the file, we see we've run into this limitation once again where it didn't capture the audio mute setting. But I really want the mute setting on so I can rock out to some jams while I'm playing my game. So how can I fix it? What I like to do is search the global config for that setting that I'm looking for. In most text editors, you can press Control F on your keyboard and that will bring up the search feature. I was going to search for audio, but I think I'll search for mute. And here is the setting I'm looking for, audio mute enable. I'll copy and paste it over to my game override config, change the value to true, and once again, don't forget to save the file. Just to confirm, I load up the same game, and when I check the audio mute option, I can see that the setting worked and mute is now on. Earlier, I mentioned that there are some settings that are not stored in the global retroarch.cfg, nor in any of the overrides, and I want to touch on those just briefly. These are remap settings, core option settings, and shader settings. Remap settings have to do with controller configuration and are found in the quick menu under controls. These settings can also be saved on a per core, directory, or game basis. Remap files are stored in the config folder under remaps. There's a separate folder for each core and the individual remap files have a .rmp extension. Core options, also in the quick menu, give access to options exclusive to each individual core. They can be saved on a per directory or game basis. And by the way, the OPT file we saw earlier was a core options settings file. Lastly, shader settings are also found in the quick menu. We have a tutorial video that deals with shaders, so be sure to check it out if you want to know more. Shaders can be saved as a global core directory or game preset. Shaders are also stored in the config folder. A global preset will be saved in the root of this directory. Core, content, and game shader presets will be stored in the core folder. 
So in conclusion, configuration files are not that exciting, I know, but it's still a valuable skill to understand how they work for at least two important reasons that I can think of. Number one, it allows you to get very granular with how you configure each console and game, making for a unique experience tailored to how you like to play. And number two, when you run into a technical issue, it's nice to be able to jump into a config file, understand how it works, and potentially address any problems. I really do hope this brief tutorial was helpful to you. Much more could be said and shared about various ways to set up RetroArch, but I like to keep it simple. The important thing is that you understand RetroArch to the point where you can get it set up the way you like. That way we can focus on the most important part, playing games and having fun. Until next time, happy gaming, my friends.